Praise the Lord and welcome on board today. What a great day that God has given unto us. It's always a blessing to come to you live with the word of God. I want to welcome you from wherever you could be watching me. Good morning, good afternoon. I know we always watch from different time zones. And we thank God for the technology that can allow us, even in times like this, to be a blessing, uh, even with the word of God. From wherever you are, bow your heads down and let's pray, even as we begin uh, what we've been studying today, the series on keys to interpreting scriptures. And we are on such an amazing, an amazing uh, moment or timings where we are talking about the Lord's Day, the Lost Day, a topic that has a lot of confusion because of lack of the keys and the consistency of understanding scripture. So I want us to pray and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us and speak to us and open the scriptures to us as he has provided in the word of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We bless you. How we pray the spirit of God, that the spirit of wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of you will be a reality in our lives. Help us to interpret scriptures line upon line, a little from here and a little from there. And help us to establish doctrine, dear God, in the manner you have provided it unto us, that on that day of the Lord we'll be found faithful and acceptable uh, to rule and reign together with you in the coming kingdom. We give you thanks and glory. In Jesus' name we do pray and give thanks. Amen and amen. We've been studying on keys to interpreting scripture and uh, we've taken some time on dealing on the key of biblical timeline. Remember what we said about the biblical timeline is that the objective of studying it is that it's going to help us be able to understand God's redemptive plan and pattern because in it there is a synonymous or there are depths of what it represents to our journey of faith. What you see from day one of restoration to day six is a journey of a believer. What you see in God taking a rest on the seventh day is a place and a rest that is being prepared, not only now for God himself alone, but his children that will be called the overcomers. The other objective of studying this key of a biblical timeline is that we are able to understand prophecy. We are living in days where everybody is prophesying what they think the Lord is talking to them. But you know what? When you understand the keys to understanding scriptures, you do not need a prophetic word to know where we are. You just need to go to the biblical timeline, comparing scriptures with scriptures, you can be able to tell exactly where we are and you can discern the timings and the seasons. Jesus speaking to the disciples, he asked them, you can discern on the seasons and the timings, but you cannot discern on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, an amazing grace, because all is hidden in the word of God. The other reason why we uh, study the biblical timeline is that we can be able to understand the septenary arrangement of scripture or the pattern, the way the scripture has been understood, uh, has been uh, interpreted so that in it we can be able to find the underlying meaning in what we are seeing in it. And that's why Paul Praying to the Ephesians, he asked God that he would give them the spirit of wisdom and knowledge in him that they can be able to understand the mysteries that are hidden in the word of God. The word of God is full of mysteries. The word of God is full of treasures. But these treasures can only be found by them that are mining, are using Isaiah 28 and verse 9 and 10, which is line upon line, precept upon precept, a little from here and a little from there. Or then all you can use uh, first corinthians chapter number two and verse number 13 comparing the spiritual things with the spiritual things because the word of god does not expect us and god himself does not expect us to use our own knowledge or wisdom to interpret the word of god because this word is pure and fully settled in the heavens that having been said in the lord's day we discovered last uh, tuesday uh, that matters that are concerned the lost day uh, bring us back to the present age and what is happening in the present age. Our scriptural reading today comes from um, uh, Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 10 and before I read it, remember what we said. The lost day in the Bible is also known as the age to come. It's known as the age to come. It's also known as the day of the Lord. The age to come uh, and then there is the day the day of the Lord, which is actually found in Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 
14, and the day of the Lord is found on 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 2. May the Lord help us to understand that God has not changed his mind. The day of the Lord, or the Lord's day, or the age to come, is still being prepared, and it is for a particular people. Let's see what uh, the book of Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 10 says. The Bible says, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, uh, write in a book and send it to uh, the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to their Tiras, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And one of the things that we need to note in this, uh, number seven is a number of completion. And that means what is in view here is the total church, is the whole church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a segmented church as per se, but it is the church of God in holistic, uh, again, uh, presenting what the Bible calls the, you know, the perfection of that which is in view. The number seven is a number of totality. And as uh, John, in the island of Patmos, as he allows God to minister to him and speak to him, he sees things that are happening on the Lord's day. But as he sees what is happening on the Lord's day, the Spirit of God first takes him back and is bringing a caution to the church. Why? Because uh, all matters to do with the Lord's day must be connected with the present age uh, so that we, they that will be found worthy during the judgment seat will qualify to get into the Lord's day. So he is in the spirit. God is showing him about the Lord's day, but he gives him a reflection of what is happening in the churches. He gives him a reflection to bring a message for the seven churches. In other words, the Lord's day is actually actually preceded by uh, the present day and the things that are happening in the present day. And as you study the matters to do with all those churches, it all begins with this saying, I know your works and I know uh, your works. And then there is a concern and there is that which God brings it as his concern. Now, what is the significance of the Lord's day? What is the significance of the Lord's day? Remember what we said, that God worked for six days and rested for the seventh day. God called the children of Israel from one land to take them to another land where he was to give them rest. If you read Hebrews chapter number four, it is very clear that God never gave the children of Israel rest and therefore he is saying, therefore, there still remain a day of rest for the people of God because the children of Israel ne never entered into the rest of God and again is for a purpose. And it's a purpose that uh, had been promised to their father Abraham that his descendants shall be many as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. And the descendants of Abraham must possess the gates from the heavenlies and from the earthly So. What is the significance of the Lord's Day? Go back to my last Tuesday's uh, podcast and you'll be able to get the details of what I am saying. But what is the significance of the Lord's Day? What does it bring to us? Uh, we have discovered that these events of the Lord's Day are interconnected with the works in the present day. And they are interconnected because they that or the work that has been done in this present age must be brought to judgment before people are ushered into uh, the Lord's day. And that brings our attention into how do we handle our present day? How do we walk our journey of faith? Because before we get into the Lord's day, there is an account that must be given. And one of the things that is calling us, is calling us to discern the timings that we are living in during the present day. And what is this time? It is a time to work. It's a time to work. We are born by grace through faith. We are born by grace through faith to receive the initial salvation. But after that, the Bible is very clear in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 8 and verse number 9 that we are his workmanship so that we can work our works of righteousness. So we've been born again with a purpose. We've been born again that we can engage in works of righteousness. We've been born again so that we can love the Lord. We can be able to serve him. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 14. The Bible is very clear that how, mo 
nor shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, uh, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Praise the name of the Lord. The Lord has delivered us. The Lord has saved us so that he can patch our conscience. I want us to understand that when we are born again, we are not fully cleansed. But the spirit of God, or the spirit of man in us has been made righteous, has been made acceptable before God. But we have a soul, we have a body. In our soul, we have the will, we have the emotions, and we have... Uh, you know, the intents of our hearts are all in the, in, in the will. We have the mind in the, in the soul. And when we get born again, our soul is not born again. That's why we can be able to remember things that we did when we were back there in the world. If you are, you are raped when you were a girl, as much as you're born again, you will remember uh, that something happened to you. If you had several girlfriends during high school, as much as you're born again, even as you lift up your hands to worship, the devil will keep on reminding you of our Angari, of our Nanotino, uh, or Latino somewhere. Why? All that is within our soul area. But do you know what? God has a desire to purge us from all unrighteousness, to purge us from all our iniquities, to purge us from all our transgressions, to purge us from the evil meditations of our hearts, so that even as we engage in the services of God, it is a work of righteousness, it's not a work of wickedness. My question is, how many allow themselves to be purged by God out of the challenges and the things that they have gone through when they get born again? I know that is a mixture of scriptures where people say, or the Bible says, First uh, Corinthians chapter number five and verse number seventeen, that behold, now I am a new creature. We need to identify what is a new creature. It is the spirit man that has been rejuvenated. It is the spirit man that has been quickened. It is the spirit man that has been made alive. But the mind, the soul, man, the emotions, you know, the will is not still yet born again and it begins a journey of redemption a journey that is supposed to take another uh, six days or five days before getting into the seventh day the first day is a day of redemption the first day is the day of salvation the fifth day it is the journey of our faith where we are working on our soul and we are working on our soul to make sure it's subjected under it is purged it is cleansed and that is why we need to be careful with our walk of salvation our souls are full of our own culture it is has a lot of you know the evil things of this world and that's why jeremiah was telling the children of israel that they need to circumcise their own souls they need to get out that outer skin that keeps on clogging the spirit man that the spirit man cannot be able to understand the will and the purposes of god so we are been born again for a purpose and the purpose is to rule and reign together with our Lord Jesus Christ in the coming kingdom but before that time we need to engage in works of righteousness it is a season to work even as we look forward for that day of the Lord then the other thing that we need to discover is that the children of Israel were delivered and God gave them commandments that were very clear on what they were supposed to do on their journey Deuteronomy me chapter number 11 verse number 3 the bible says and it shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently and to my commandments which i have commanded you this day to love the lord your god and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul they were to love the lord with all manner of diligence they were to serve the lord but before serving him they needed to love him and for reasons why they needed to love him because only God can disengage you from your cultural evils. Only God can disengage you from your iniquities of the forefathers. Only God can disengage you from the transgression and the sin that so easily besets us. And that's why he desires us to 
love him first. He desires us to spend time with him first. Mark chapter number 3 and verse number 14, the Bible says, He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Look at this. Jesus called the disciples so that they can first be with him even before they start. Let me talk to you if you are a pastor somewhere. It is dangerous to work with people that you can never pray together with. It is dangerous to have people around you that you cannot be able to engage with them in scriptures. You cannot be able to get a time whereby you can be in the presence of God together. And people are serving God. People would want to engage in the church. They want to be ushers. They want to be singers. People want to serve God in the Sunday school, but they don't want to be available at the time of prayer. They don't want to be available at the time of the Bible study. The Bible says that Jesus called the disciples first not to serve, but to spend time together with him. And I'm challenging you, if you are listening to me from wherever you are listening to me, if you desire serving God, I want you to remember that the great call that God has called you is not to sing in the choir is not to be a Sunday school teacher is not to be behind that camera but what God has called you is that you can be able to spend time together with him it is dangerous to work with people that do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, or they don't have a relationship or a time where they can get themselves in the place of prayer if you're serving in a church, I am calling you to get involved in moments of prayer, get involved in the moment of waiting upon the Lord because the work we are to engage with, if it's going to be accepted at the judgment seat it is not any kind of work we don't want to be like those people who went before the Lord and they are saying, God remember or Jesus, you know, remember that our master, we chased demons in your name, we did ABCD in your name and God looked at them and he says depart from me you workers of iniquity you know i do not know you we have so many people that are serving god but god is saying he does not know them because what god desires is not our service first he desires our hearts he desires that he can purge our conscience he desires that he can clean us from all evil so that the works that we give they are works of righteousness remember ephesians chapter number two we are his workmanship that we can be able to engage in works of righteousness it is not enough to give money in a church God wants your spirit God wants your soul cleaned and purged because the Lord's day is awaiting and it is for them that have been found are faithful and for a reason again the work that we do must be a work of faith it must be a labor of love it must be the patience of hope and let me tell you when you serve the Lord you know with this kind of people that understand it is a work of faith they understand it is a labor of love it are, they understand it's a patience of hope let me tell you, Hamutangangana, you will never struggle with those kind of people. They are people who motivate themselves. They are people who drive themselves. They are people who fill in gap. Let me tell you, it's a great burden to serve with people in the house of God who does not know that it will be required of them at the judgment seat before they are rewarded with entering into the Lord's day. First Thessalonian is saying, we give thanks to God always for you, or making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And why do we need to work by faith? Because it's not our work. It is the Lord's work, and it must be done according to the pattern. When God called Moses to build a tabernacle, he told Moses, I don't need your engagement and mind and your thought patterns in this, and it must be done according to the pattern that you've been able to see on the mountain and it must be a work of faith and it must be a labor of love you know you must love it you must enjoy it you must do it with joy and jubilation I don't know whether if you're a pastor like me you've seen people who come to serve Amengia kwa ibada, amejileta mwenyewe, amenuna, and you wonder surely, why would you pay your transport to come and labor in something that you do not enjoy? Remember that which will be rewarded is a labor 
of love. You are loving the people you serve. You are loving the job that you do in the house of God. You are loving the area of allocation of what you are doing. And because you are loving that which you are doing, you will drag all your resources to be able to do that work with love. You know what? People who love the work of God, they will even bring their own things to be able to serve the Lord. But people who are doing it for a business, they would rather put their things separately unless they are being paid for. But if you love the Lord, my goodness, you will use your mind, you will use your soul to be able to serve the Lord with all you have. And my challenge and entreatment to us, let's love the Lord with all our hearts so that the labor that we give is a labor of love. And then it's a pain of hope. You are patiently serving God with hope because you know only God can be able to reward you. Nobody can be able to pay you the services that we serve in the house of God. The Bible says Revelation chapter number 2 you know, uh, the, the Bible says that the, the, the church in Ephesus I know your works, verse number 2 I know your works, I know your labor, I know your patience and that you cannot bear who are evil. But he says, I have this against you. And the thing that I have against you is that you have forgotten the first love. And what is this first love? It's the love of his coming. It's the love of his appearing. It's the love of the Lord's day. It is the desire to be found on that Lord's day, to be able to rule together with him. We, uh, well, well, the, our last message for when is the Bible study, my husband preached something that was so powerful that we have servants of God that have taken our attention from that Lord's day, from the day of his coming, from the purpose of our salvation and we are making the people of God comfortable in this wilderness of life that they do not love about the second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me, uh, let me tell us today that John in the island of Patmos speaking to the church in Ephesus he's telling them, I know your labor of patience but you have missed out the focus. The focus of our labor is the Lord's day so that we can be able to rest on the Lord's day when the time comes and even when our work is tested from the from the, at the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ. The other church that I want to pick up from the book of Revelation, remember what we are saying. On the Lord's day, John in the island of Patmos, by the Holy Spirit, this helps him to reflect back on matters that are happening in the churches in the present day. And he is writing to the church while in the Lord's day. Having tasted that day, he is bringing warnings to the church that as we serve the Lord, as we work for the Lord, let us be reminded not every work was done, not every work was survived, not every work will be acceptable so that we can do it in accordance to the word of God. Um, the other church was the church in Pagamos. The church in Pagamos was a church that I really loved the Lord. He said, I know your works and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith in the days in which Antipas and my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat the things that are sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Look at this. This is a church that loved the Lord. It's a church that suffered. It's a church that sacrificed so much, you know, in the requirements of what God desired. But God has one thing against them. And the thing he had, it is because they had allowed the doctrine of Balaam. And what was the doctrine of Balaam? When Balaam was, you know, the doctrine was of Balaam, when Balaam was sent to cast the children of Israel and who could not be able to cast them, then they came up with another strategy and the strategy was to compromise the children of Israel by allowing the world to come to the people that God had set apart. They allowed them to get intermarried because they knew if we cannot be able to cast them, then we can allow them, we can cause them to allow worldly things to come in the house of God and that will be enough to make sure they are not preparing themselves for the day 
of rest. And this is where the church of Jesus Christ finds itself today, that a lot of worldly things have been allowed in the church. And because of allowing those things, the Bible is saying, I know your works, and I know you have done all the best, but you have accommodated the world. You have made the people of God comfortable with the things of this world. And I have that against you, because the church was supposed to be a separate people, a people called out by God, a people that is cleaning themselves and preparing themselves for the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, it is time to serve. If you are listening to me today, and thank you so much for all of you that have joined in today. I really appreciate your support. But as I bring this to a close, I want to encourage somebody that we have been called to work. We have been called to serve the Lord. Joshua chapter number 4 and verse number 15, you know, uh, talking to the children of Israel, he is telling them, and if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of Amorites in whose you dwell, but as for me, I will serve the Lord. God has called us to serve. God has delivered you and you have options. You can either serve him, you can either serve the God of this world or you can be able uh, to serve the God of your forefathers in any way. You will be serving. But the question is, will you serve God in a manner that is acceptable? Because at the judgment seat, it must be a work of faith. It must be a labor of love. It must be a a patience of hope, enduring, even as we serve, looking forward that God will be able to reward us. Psalms 2, 11, the Bible says, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Let's serve the Lord. I know we are in a time whereby we've been challenged differently, but God is calling us back to engage in the works of our service. Some of us have been offended by our pastors. Some of us have been offended by life. Some of us Challenges are too many, but let's go back to the service of the work of the Lord. Because you know what? At the judgment set, it is a judgment of works. And those works will be judged that will be able to help us or usher us in to the coming of the day of the Lord. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I want to warn us that money or mammon is a great competitor to the work of God. Most of us are lost in our businesses. God will require works of righteousness at the judgment seat. Make sure if you are earning money, let your money be used to work for God so that you can invest in eternity a work that is going to be able to help you stand even at the judgment seat. Yes, salvation is a free gift, but James talking to the brethren, he said, even so faith, if it has no works, it is dead if faith is left alone. What am I saying? We are born again by grace through faith. But from there on, we need to engage in a work. It is a work number one of the salvation of our soul. The cleansing of the camp. Keeping the sin outside the camp. Keeping the leaven outside the camp. And as we clean up our camp, as we clean up this temple, now we can engage in the works of service because it will be righteous work that is acceptable as the judgment said. As I bring this to a close, does God reward service? Yes, he does. And he rewards us here or not and even in eternity to come. Uh, Mark chapter number 10 verse number 26, the Bible says, Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, this is, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or a father or a mother or a ch children or lands for my sake and the gospel who shall not receive a hundredfold in this age, a hundredfold in this age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and land. Oh my goodness, believers don't like hearing this. And persecution. And in the age to come, during the Lord's day, eternal life may, but may, who 
are first will be last and the last will be first. Yes, God rewi- you, you know, God God rewards the righteous. He pays the righteous. When you serve God, it is not in vain. A people were hard complaining and murmuring on whether God serves the Lord in the book of Malachi, chapter number one. And I want to finish with it, chapter number three. And I want to finish with this. In the age to uh, no, not in the age to come, okay. Uh, the people complain harshly. The people complain harshly. Uh, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinances and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. A book of remembrance then was opened for they that feared the Lord as they spoke to one another. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate upon his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On that day I will make them my jewels. On which day? On that day of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Lord's day. They will be the jewels of God. And I will spare them as a man spares his son for who serves him. As a m- then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and who does not serve the Lord. Does it pay to serve the Lord? For sure, yes, it does. When you study the book of Ruth, you will see for sure Ruth was able to get a kingsman redeemer after serving God and serving in a particular manner. She did it diligently and she was doing it, you know, from morning to evening, from, you know, in season and out of season. And even after collecting her barley, she would beat it, separate it because she knew other threshing floor, which is the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ, God himself will do a separation for himself. So if you're serving the Lord, my entreatment to you, do it diligently. Do it in season. Do it out of season. God will reward us a hundredfold in this world. He will give us brothers, sisters, mothers, resources, and even persecution and eternal life in the age to come. I have no time to share my testimonies on the benefits of serving God, but you can be sure as we continue, I will keep on sharing. May the Lord richly bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. You've been a blessing to us, and thank you for the support that you have continually given us. It's always a blessing to come to you with the word of God. Wherever you are listening me from, I challenge you to serve God and serve God diligently. Get away wickedness from your service because Titus chapter number 1 and verse 15 is very clear that their works are not the works that are acceptable even before the Lord because they are doing it with hands of iniquity for they have denied the Lord God who is even their own savior. May the Lord help us as a church not only to serve but do it in a clean and in a diligent way. Bow your heads. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. As we serve you, give us the grace. Give us the wisdom. Help us to be clean so that we can serve you diligently in a manner that it will be accepted at the judgment seat of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and glory in Jesus' name. And we all say amen and amen. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you give us your comment and your feedback. Always a blessing to minister to you. May God richly bless you.